But notice again, the double standards. You white Christians, you've done this kind of crime, but totally ignorant of 1400 years of Islamic slave trade. This kind of Christophobia should be scandalous to you, and it isn't because your pastors have made you weak that we carve out independent Christian states in the Middle East where Christians will be safe, that we declare war on Boko Haram like we did against ISIS and we bomb the crap out of those Islamists. Oh. Going to talk about a different topic. Now you do find from time to time that you find these useless hecklers. They can never speak for themselves. They only come and they only come and heckle other people because they're parasites, they're parasites in the way that they go about doing their business. They've got nothing positive to add to the discussion. No alternative. But all they want to do is shout and scream. So, ladies and gentlemen, moving on to another topic. Why is it wrong to criticize Mohammed in France? Why is it wrong to criticize Mohammed in France? It's not wrong to criticize Mohammed in France. Okay. It's guaranteed by the law in France. It's not wrong. I want to talk about. Brother, don't feed the trolls. Bro, I want to talk about a myth that lots of people are spreading in the park. Put your hand up if you've heard people say that Christianity is a dying religion. It is a, a mantra. It is a mantra that we have heard by Muslims in the park that Christianity is a dying religion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to show to you that parasites like this guy who just come and heckle because no one will listen to him if he goes and speaks anywhere are wrong. And Muslims who tell you that Christianity is a dying religion are wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to provide as my evidence the research done by a body of academics in a group called Pew Research. These are university academics who study religious trends across the world. And this is what they say in an article and a report called Global Christianity, a report on the size and distribution of the world's Christian population. Now, this is what they say. And I want you to remember this, ladies and gentlemen, the next time you hear a Muslim say that Christianity is dying, they say this, the number of Christians around the world has nearly quadrupled in the last hundred years. Everybody say quadrupled. Quadrupled. Say it like you're on a pair, guys, because this heckler will shout. So everybody say quadrupled in the last 100 years, from about 600 million in 1910 to more than 2 billion in 2010. But the world's overall population has also risen rapidly from an estimated 1.8 billion in 1910 to 6.9 billion in 2010 as a result. Christians make up about the same proportion, about the same portion of the world's population today, 32%, as they did a century ago, 35%. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, Christianity continues to grow in line with world population. This apparent stability, however, masks a momentous shift. Although Europe and the Americas still are home to a majority of the world's Christians, 63%, that is a much lower share than it was in 1910 
93%. And the proportion of Europeans and Americans who are Christians has dropped from 95% in 1910 to 76% in 2010 in Europe as a whole. And from 96% to 86% in the Americas as a whole. So in other words, the Christian faith has moved out of the Anglosphere. It has moved out of European civilization and it has become a truly global religion. A global religion that has continued to grow in proportion to world population. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have to recognize the point of my parasite here, which is that there has been a great apostasy in Europe. There has been, in Western Europe, a massive falling away from the Christian faith. But what the Muslims don't realize is that there has been a revival of the Christian faith in Eastern Europe, in Poland, and Romania, and Hungary, and Ukraine, and Russia, and the Czech Republic, and Greece, and Serbia. The Christian faith continues to grow. And what is the main driving force of the growth of any religion? Its birth rate. Islam is the fastest growing religion because of birth rate, not because of conversion. The fastest growing religion by conversion, according to Pew Research, which acknowledges that Islam is the fastest growing religion by birth rate, the fastest growing religion by conversion is Christianity. The Christian faith is the fastest growing religion by conversion. However, we need to look a little deeper, brothers and sisters, because that growth rate is mainly in Africa. It is mainly in Africa because of the massive growth of Pentecostal churches and the higher birth rates amongst Christian families in Africa compared to anywhere else. We Christians cannot assume that the current trend will continue. There is no reason to assume that it will. And we as Christians must galvanize ourselves to deal with the real problems that the church faces. And what are those real problems? Not how we deal with the question of the transvestite community, as the Lambeth Conference obsesses about. Not whether we should have the Latin or the vernacular mass as obsessed about by traditional Catholics, but whether we are creating families in our fellowships in the West. That's one of the most fundamental questions that is challenging the Western church. Secondly, the fact that we Christians are spending too much time, too much energy, and too much resources fighting one another rather than evangelizing the West, its culture, and its people. As someone who does evangelism, I can tell you from my first-hand experience that if you do keep your hands off other people's property, Recording me. I don't want to be recorded. Well, stand off camera then. No one's forcing you to stand there. Don't want to be recorded. Ladies and gentlemen, the parasite... Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, our parasite here is now... Let's put him on camera. Now's your chance to debate. Come here. Do you want to debate? Let's, let's debate him. So, yeah, no, we are doing it on camera. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. We're doing it on camera. He's filming me. Go on. So debate me now. Debate me now. You don't want to debate me now. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay. 
We won't be blurring his face, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, because we want everyone to see the parasites in the park. So, ladies and gentlemen, we Christians need to unite and we need to recommit ourselves to evangelizing non-Christians. Because when we Christians, when we Christians rediscover our unity and our commitment to evangelism, evangelizing the individual and evangelizing the culture, we'll begin to create a groundswell, a shift in the West. But until we Christians revive ourselves, we can't expect the Western church to revive, which means that it is the responsibility of all of you, my brothers and sisters, to get your fellowships into shape to deal with the real problems and to stop fighting over the stupid ones because it is a sign of the Western church's irrelevance that we obsess about the trivial and not the significant. And we need to rediscover what's significant. We have made ourselves irrelevant to the equation because we don't stand up for ourselves. And the first job of the church is to secure its own rights and its own abilities to practice its religion. Because when we can process down the Muslim community with the cross held high, we have won our liberty. But right now, you have the veto of the mob in the West, which we have seen numerous times in Speaker's Corner, where the mob has silenced the debate on numerous occasions. So, Christians, the liberal culture has created a vacuum and there are many groups trying to fill that vacuum. And right now, because of the incompetence of our bishops and the incompetence of our pastors, we Christians are not trying to fill the vacuum created by liberalism. But the ethno-nationalists are, the environmentalists are, the communists are, the Islamists are. We must become contenders for the culture. Christians, find your balls and don't believe the lie told by the Muslims in the park that Christianity is a dying religion. There are places in the world where our faith is dying. England is one of them. That is true. The Middle East is another because of Islamist aggression and persecution. And the answer is the same in both cases. That we Christians learn to stand up for ourselves again and we learn to stand up for our brothers and sisters again. When we are willing to ensure that the Christians of the Middle East have their own independent country, their own independent state carved out of the Middle East, then we will have secured a future for the Christians of the Middle East. When we as Christians see that the fight of the brothers and sisters in Nigeria is the same as the fight of the brothers and sisters in Syria and the same as the one fought in Kosovo and the same as the one fought in Pakistan and the same as the one fought in India, then we Christians will have become a contender on the global stage. But our leaders are visionless and we are happy to accept visionless leaders. We are happy to pay for useless pastors. We are happy to attend churches that are not up to much and not doing much at all. Change yourselves, Christians. Change the church and then you change the world. Perfect. Any questions? You had a... Go on. Yes. So the question is. Okay. You, we know you're a Muslim. So, ladies and gentlemen, the question is where should Christians have an independent state in the Middle East? It should be carved out of Syria. 
Christians in the Middle East. The Syrian state is a failed state. Iraq is also a failed state. Let those states partition. Let the Sunnis have their bit. Let the Shia have their bit. Let the Kurds have their bit. Yes, I support Kurdish independence. And let the Christians, the Assyrian Christians, the Armenian Christians, and the, um, the Greek Christians of the Middle East have their bit. Redraw the maps so that those communities who can't live together can live in peace apart. And those Christians in the Middle East will have a future. Another place where it could happen is to cut a section out of Egypt because Egypt has one of the highest populations of Christians who are regularly persecuted by the Muslim majority. It doesn't deserve to survive if it persecutes Christians. Any state that persecutes the church should be toppled. Next question. So the question is, it's more of a statement. It's a terrible idea because we'll create another Israel-Palestine situation. The brother is absolutely right. That is exactly what we will do. However, the alternative is that we watch our brothers and sisters in the Middle East die slowly. So make your choice, Christians. Do you want to see the church die slowly in the Middle East? Or do you want to replace one kind of trouble with another? Choose your evil. Next question. How many people are you planning to kill to implement your ideas? By someone else. If no one else wants to question you. Then I'll move on to my next topic. Sorry? Why can't we become parliamentary Christians? So the question is, why can't we become parliamentary Christians? And I want to be clear, I am not one of those Christians who believes that religion and politics are separate. Our Lord says, to render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. But the Psalms say that the earth is the Lord's and everything upon it. If everything belongs to the Lord, what belongs to Caesar? Indeed, even Caesar himself belongs to God, which means every political office belongs to God. And so Christians should be involved in politics, working from a Christian political narrative towards Christian political goals, of which the cessation of the violent persecution of Christians is the first principle of Christian politics. Perfect. Christians stand in solidarity with one another. Next question. What? So the Muslim says that the answer to Muslims persecuting Christians is that Christians should flee their homeland and come to Europe. In other words, they aren't needed in Egypt. They aren't needed in Syria. They aren't needed in Iraq. If they don't like being persecuted, let them leave. I say no. I say that we stand up to Muslims that have that attitude, that we crush the Islamist networks, that we carve out independent Christian states in the Middle East where Christians will be safe, that we declare war on Boko Haram like we did against ISIS and we bomb the crap out of those Islamists. It is time to stop playing with the Islamists and those who sympathize with them. Because as you play with the Islamists and those who sympathize with them, their terrorism continues to grow. This very year, we saw Muslim mobs in a city in France parading with high-powered assault rifles in the streets. That happened in Western Europe this year because the French government is weak because the British government is weak, 
all of us must face regularly the possibility that a terrorist may decide to pick up a knife or a gun and kill us in the street. How many more people must die before we get serious with the Islamists? How many more people must die before attitudes displayed by this Muslim become scandalous? If I said, if the Muslims don't like it here, let them leave to a man they would call me an Islamophobe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he stood here and said if the Christians don't like being persecuted in the Middle East, let them leave. And you were not outraged. You were not outraged. And why were you not outraged? Because you are weak. Because you have been turned into wimps by the Liberals. A middle class church does not have the answer to the struggle that we face. Because a middle class church is conflict averse. This kind of Christophobia should be scandalous to you and it isn't. And it isn't because your pastors have made you weak. Discover a muscular Christianity. There's vote! There's vote! There's vote! There's vote! There's vote! Question. When the Muslims facing our defense, they say, but Jesus says you should love me. The Jesus actually says you should tell me your cheeks. And we've been doing it for the last 1,500 years. So, brother. To be honest with you, my cheeks are hurting and I can't take it. Let me, let me reply. Let me reply. Because, brother, I want to, I want to say to you, you can believe what you like, brother. I don't care. Well, why are you studying, I don't care. brother? Brother, keep it yourself. Brother, well, why are you studying? Keep it to yourself. But he comes to Speaker's Corner. He's coming to a place to hear what people believe, but then he's telling them to keep it to themselves. I'll let you decide whether we're facing a real intellect. But let me answer the brother's question. Let me. Brother. 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 Okay. Guys, if you want to listen to him, stay here. If you want to listen to my answer, we're going to move over there. Mind yourself, mind yourself. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So let me, let me answer the question of the brother. Because I think it's really important that Christians are always reflective. And I'm going to say something that will be critical of you now, brother. But I want you to hear me in, in charity. That in this struggle, that we Christians must always examine our heart and ask whether we are being motivated by hatred, revenge or love. Because the narrative, the way that my brother Catch phrased it, and it was hyperbole, I'm sure, which is, I've been turning the other cheek for 1400 years, my cheeks are getting raw, so can't I punch back now? Well, I would say that we Christians must continue to turn the other cheek. But turning the other cheek is not the same as pacifism. Turning the other cheek is not the same as apathy. Turning the other cheek is not the same as laziness. Turning the other cheek means that when you fight back, you're not doing it out of revenge. You're not doing it out of hatred. You're doing it out of love and out of justice. It is unjust to stand by and allow Islamists who are sponsored by the Turkish state to ally themselves with Azerbaijan and to attack Armenia. Our love for our Armenian brothers and sisters means that we should stand against the Islamists. But our hatred is directed to the ideas that motivate and inspire the Islamists. 
not of the people themselves. When their power has been removed, when their assault rifles broken, when their tanks destroyed and they have no means to commit harm, then we should assess who of them can we help and who of them are beyond help and we deal with them accordingly. Our love, our love for our brothers and sisters must inspire us to stand up to the Islamists. But that should not be equated with passivism, but we must not surrender our souls or our hearts to revenge or hatred or anger. We must, as John Damascus said, we must, as John Damascus said, he said that we take up the sword to defend our brothers and sisters. That's what we must do. We must be motivated by love. Why have you come here? Why have you come here? I have the right to come here. You do, but unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen. I pay taxes. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen. Right, go on. Why you here? Sorry, let me just yeah. deal with his question. Sorry, can you start? Can you go back to me? Can you spread out by two minutes, please? Listen, my friend. No, go on. I, I go come on. from Gordova. My origin. I'm from Gordova. I have the. I can prove it. What the what the Catholic did to my people? They kicked the Jewish and the Muslim out from their homeland. Let's listen to proper stuff. Yeah. Nagorno-Karabakh. Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, you see, within the borders of uh, Azerbaijan. So what's wrong with them trying to take their own country back? So the question is, yeah. guys, there's no need to move in because I'm always going to repeat the question. Yeah, we need to spread out, guys, or the police will just move us away. Spread out, please. So the question is, the question is, what's wrong with Azerbaijan attacking territory that is legally its own? Well, I wonder if he felt the same way when the Serbians were attacking territory that was legally their own. Except that then the minority that was being persecuted was Muslim. I wonder if he felt the same when, when the Burmese government was attacking the territory that was their own and the Rohingya Muslims were forced out of their lands. Why? Because they were Muslim. We see the Liberals have this double standard all the time. The fact of the matter is, Artsakh, as the Armenians call it, the disputed area of our greater Armenia is ethnically Armenian. The majority of the people there are Armenian. And they did not want to be part of Azerbaijan when the Soviet Union collapsed. The borders ended up being what they were because they were not settled by a, an ordered organizing of the borders. And so we need to separate the borders appropriately and Odsak needs to go to Armenia so that the richer Azerbaijan doesn't have to pay for a population that doesn't even want them as a government. Your question. Azerbaijan is Muslim country, but Shia, anti-Iran. Iran now stay. Iran, Iran stay. Iran stay with Armenia. Anti -Armenia. What's your question, sir? What's the question? If you're not asking a question, I'm just going to go on to my next topic. Do you know Iran stay with with Armenia or not? The question is: Do I know that Iran has supported Armenia? Tacitly, yes. I know that the Iranians have because they want to have a bulk walk against the expansionist ideology of Turkey. Turkey is a criminal state. It is like the Third Reich today. It carried out a genocide of Christians and murdered over a million Armenian, Greek and Syrian Christians. When you go on holiday to Turkey, it's like going on holiday to the Third Reich. When you buy a product of Turkey, you are buying a product of the Third Reich. You wouldn't go to Nazi Germany, don't go to Turkey. You wouldn't buy from Nazi Germany, don't buy from, don't buy from Turkey. Boycott Turkey. So, any other questions before I move on?
kebab. This guy he mentioned the never had a kebab. border of Armenia. He's never had a kebab. Can I can I can I ask this guy? He goes and watch the map of the Armenia in 1915 and how big was the Armenia? Then what they did? Why they can't claim their land back? But always the Muslim got to take, claim their land back. Yes. Yeah. Christians. Christians. You need to get political. You need to remember the historical crimes against the church and you need to have them as part of your understanding of history. The mass murder of Christians and the persecution of Christians has been our experience for 1400 years under Muslim rule. And it is time that we as Christians from west to east, from north to south, remember the history of the church because it will inform our politics. The reason why the liberals are so weak on Islamists is because they don't remember the Ottoman Empire. It's because a beautiful one, he says, a beautiful that desecrated churches, that kidnapped Christian children, that raped Christian women that invaded Christian lands, that killed Christians who converted from Islam, that killed Christians for practicing their faith, that reduced the rights of Christians. That is the beautiful empire. But yet, if we desecrate mosques, rape Muslim women, kidnap Muslim children, he will cry out for a crime. He will cry out Islamophobia. And that is the double standard. Why, oh Christians, are you not outraged by views like this? Why are you not outraged by views like this? Go on. Christians have never gone through shit. Muslims have been persecuted since the fucking dawn of time. Exactly. Your religion has constantly pushed out people. I myself, a former Christian, have been pushed out. You're like your religion. Nothing ever happened. Are you asking a question, Miss? I'm not asking a question. I'm simply saying something that you're speaking. Okay. So allow me to reply. So, ladies and gentlemen, the sister makes a statement that Christians have never had any trouble, and that Muslims have had trouble for centuries. Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is an indictment of the Western education system. This young lady doesn't know anything about church history. Put your hand up if you're an Armenian. Put your hand up if you know about the genocide of 1.2 Armenian Christians. Do you know about the Armenian genocide? Oh, so she does know. But apparently, that doesn't constitute problems. Put your hand up if you know about the fact that Syria, Palestine and Jordan were Christians before Muslims invaded. Did you know that? Oh, so she does know. She does know. She does know. She does know. But according to her, we Christians have not gone through any kind of shit. Put your hand up if you know about the Janissaries. The kidnapped Christian children who were forcibly converted to Islam. Put your hand up if you know about the Janissaries. Did you know about the Janissaries? No, she didn't know. So this kind of BOM liberal progressive rhetoric that says that we Christians have gone through no trouble is the utter crap, the utter rubbish, the utter rubbish that we Christians need to be correcting in the public sphere. Because this lady has just spewed out a lie for political reasons. She knew about what Christians went through, but she said Christians have gone through no trouble at all. That is the narrative of the liberal progressives. Next question. Because someone in Macedonia is half a million Muslims died in this country because of the Serbians. Yes. So the question, the statement is, I haven't mentioned the massacres of Bosnian Muslims. But notice again the double standards. 
You white Christians, you've done this kind of crime, but totally ignorant of 1400 years of Islamic slave trade, totally ignorant of genocides carried out by Muslim empires, totally ignorant of invasions of lands that were not their own by Muslims, empires. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ, one second, wait your horses. One second, Christians, we need to be correcting these kinds of narratives. Because if we don't tell our history, other people will tell our history for us. And that is what they are doing. You came to my land. And we, the continent, Europe. Okay? Go and, go and debate him. Go and debate him. So, question. Do, do you know, do you know, Georgia is a Christian country. Turkey supports the, 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 uh, Georgia. Do you know this one? So the question is, do I know that Turkey is supporter of Georgia? Yes, I do actually know. And I also know why. It's because Turkey and Russia are regional opposites. They are regional adversaries. And they are playing a game of chess between one another and the Caucasus is the chessboard. The Armenian, Azerbaijani and Georgian states are the chessboard upon which Turkey and Russia are playing geopolitics. Christians, that is the problem with nationalism. When Rus Orthodox Russia is willing to sell Orthodox Armenia under the bus, Orthodox Georgia under the bus, it is because they are working to a nationalist politic rather than a Christian politic. And that is why Christians need to rediscover a Christian politic so that Russian Orthodox, Armenian and Georgian stand together against an Islamist government in Ankara that is hell-bent on re-establishing an Ottoman Empire that invaded Christian lands, enslaved Christian children, forcibly converted Christian people, raped Christian women, desecrated Christian churches, and you were not taught any of that at school. No, no, next question from someone else. From someone else. No, any other questions or I'm going to move on to my next topic. Do you know Iran supports Armenia? He said, yes. Do you know uh, uh, Turkey supports Georgia? He said, yes. Why you push Islamists in, inside? Because, they, well, be, so, about what? ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to address his point, just because I don't want to be rude to the uncle, but then I'm going to move on to my next topic. Ladies and gentlemen, why did I mention Islamists in regards to Turkey? This is why. Because Turkey has paid and transported Islamists who fought in Syria with Al-Qaeda against the Syrian Arab government and transported them to Azerbaijan to fight with the Azerbaijanis against the Armenian Christians. That's why I mentioned it. Erdogan is known as an Islamist inside Turkey. They know he's an Islamist. There are many Turks who are secular and believe in the project of Ataturk who are against Erdogan because they know he is an Islamist. He's a man that is a, being aggressive towards Greece, sending troops to Libya, interfering in Algeria, sending troops to Azerbaijan. He is a man who is wanting to establish an Islamic empire and Turkey as the source of that Islamic empire. And the European Union is demonstrating that it is completely pointless, useless and irrelevant because the EU can't stand up to Greece. So, next topic.